Thank you for joining us. I'm Andy Arnold, CEO and Senior Wealth Advisor here at Centerline Wealth Advisors. This is the fourth in our series we like to call Between the Lines. We wanted to create a forum to give you some insight into our internal analysis process and the thought leadership here at Centerline. We felt it would be helpful to let you in on some of our research methodology and deliberations over a wide array of topics. There is much going on these days and no shortage of frightening headlines. Every generation has had its own challenges, but our generation has witnessed an almost unprecedented array of major events. The dot-com bust, 9-11, real estate collapse, and uh, the associated Great Recession, a global pandemic, and now the potential start of World War III. Today, we have a special guest, Mark Peterson, author of the popular Student of the Markets monthly publication. He is also a director at BlackRock and concentrates on investment strategies and views. Ben Doniger, Centerline's resident CFP, is going to help me extract lots of good information from Mark over the next 30 minutes or so. Mark, all eyes are on Ukraine and the terrible situation there. So we want to get into that. Uh, but before that happened, I think we were all concerned about inflation and uh, things like the Fed raising rates uh, this year. Uh, so we definitely want to cover uh, that fertile ground. Uh, Mark, so welcome. And we can't wait to hear what you have to say today. Great. Thanks, Andy. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having me on your call uh, between the lines. I like that title. Um, and uh, yeah, full plate of concerns, right? I feel like uh, you're coming back uh, with a filled up uh, plate of uh, Thanksgiving meal, right? Where it's just packed with different concerns between the Ukraine-Russia situation, Fed Reserve raising interest rates, inflation, market volatility, right? Uh, go across the board and feels like we've got them all, all the boxes checked from a concern standpoint. And uh, we haven't even gotten to the midterm elections later this year, right? Uh, so you can find me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pile that on as well. Nothing like seeing all those commercials starting up soon, right? So uh, we'll try to hit some of those. Obviously, tough to hit all of those. Uh, uh, you know, I think the a couple of the big pieces are the Federal Reserve raising rates, uh, and I think that inflation story. I think you're right. Uh, is is probably a little bit underrated at this point. Uh, so we'll hit on a lot of that. Uh, um, on those topics, but let's just jump in since it is so top of mind. I think for everybody, the the Russia Ukraine situation uh, clearly creating some market volatility here in the near term, uh, creating energy prices right going up in a big way. Although they're coming back down a little bit today, which is a good sign. Certainly, why the market's rallying. Here's an, just a, a chart. I think you've probably seen a lot of these, but this is our version of the chart. Just looking at some of the the geopolitical challenges over time, right? Going back to, to when Germany invaded Poland to start World War II back in 1939, just what the market did a little bit before that, a couple months after, and then one and three years later. So a lot of different numbers on here, probably focused on the far right-hand column um, where you can see where the market was three years later, right? Uh, and it just shows the amazing resilience the, mar the, resilience the market has in the face of some of these events. Uh, I think the only one that was negative three years later uh, was uh, Germany invading Poland. And that was because we were still right in the middle of World War II where the outcome wasn't certain. You can see just move one, one line down there. You can see from Pearl Harbor three years later, the war's, uh, the war's outcome was much more certain uh, three years after Pearl Harbor. And you can see how the market reacted. So uh, for us, just a, a good reference point, you'll see us, we do this a lot within student of market. We lean a lot on history, right? It's the old Mark Twain, history doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. And I think one of the rhymes here is that the market does show tremendous resilience in, uh, in the face of some of these challenges. So uh, certainly something to nice, nice to have in our pocket. You know, volatility has picked up. We just look at, uh, we like to look at 2% uh, trading days. So just any day in the stock market where it moves up or down by 2%, you can kind of notice that on a statement, right? Uh, fairly uh, fairly a decent sized move. And you can see through the end of February, we had four so far this year. Uh, if we were updated, and if we counted today, we'd be up to six because we had one uh, earlier this week as well. I think it was, uh, what was it, uh, Monday? 
Uh, so we're we've six. If we have six at the end of today, that would be almost as many as we had all of last year, right? Just two percent move in the market, uh, up or down. And you can see some of the historical years here where you've had a lot of days. Uh, look at 2008 in the height of the global financial crisis. We had 72 days where you were up or down 2% uh, in the market. And uh, there's about 252 trading days in a year. You can see what I do all day with my time, by the way. I count plus and minus 2% days. Yeah, but Mark, I, my, my eye went right to 2008 because I remember that year so well. I was working, you know, six and seven days a week. And, you know, some, some of those moves were almost 5% in a day. And, you know, so sometimes, you know, our families would ask, well, you know, we had a 5% move down today in 19 more days. Am I going to be at zero? And, and so we were trying to feel those kind of questions uh, at that time. So hopefully we're, we're not on track for, to beat 72. That was not a lot of fun. Yeah, we're certainly not on that pace. You start to do the math. Uh, it's hard. 72 is one every three or four days you were getting a 2% move. So to your point, it was such a different environment uh, back then. Uh, even 2020, look at the, and all, all of 2020 was really focused on that first quarter uh, when the pandemic, right, and the shutdowns were just starting to sink in. So uh, one thing I think is true of, of this volatility, you, you look at some of these periods where you had a lot of volatile days, it all surrounds uh, the economic uncertainty that the market's trying to digest. Think about the economic uncertainty in 2008 or the first quarter of 2020, right? That's peak economic uncertainty. That's what the markets wrestles with when we get these periods of volatility. Really, where we're headed with the economy, are we going to tip into a recession? That's really the what the market uh, is digesting at those points in time. And certainly, uh, we're faced with some challenges, but we don't see the recession this year. There's such strong economic footing with still a restart of the economy, right? A lot of cash on the sidelines. We'll touch on that. Employment picture looks good. Uh, even with higher energy costs, we don't think that drags us into a recession. So some of this volatility might to step, might might start to, to to really slow down if we get a better feeling for where we're at and where we're headed. Uh, you really think about it, the first couple months of the year, we priced in a lot of bad news, right? Think of all the bad news we, we priced in. Uh, it's really sunk in here the, the first couple months of the year. I think that might set up for a period of time where we get some of that back. And just to take a little bit of a step back, it's, I think it's good to remind ourselves how good the market's been over the last three calendar years. Uh, we actually looked at it historically, uh, the window from 2019 through 2021, stocks averaged 26% per year. Uh, and if you look at three-year windows of time historically, that's number eight out of 94 three-year periods, believe it or not. So number eight out of 94 best three-year uh, runs for stocks historically. You can see they average 26% per year. To put that in perspective, uh, the old rule of 72, if you've heard about this, if you divide the number of years into 72, it'll tell you the percentage you need to double your money over that period of time. So 72 divided by three is about 24%. So you can see on this chart, 26% uh, more than doubles your money over that three-year period of time. Historically, it takes a little bit more than seven years to double your money if you average about 10% in stock. So clearly pretty historic run in, in stocks. Uh, and of course, this is a good news, bad news story. The good news is we've had some really nice returns for stocks here in the last couple of years. The bad news is whenever you have these this nice run in stocks, the next three years is never quite as good, right? You can see on the right, we just highlighted the top 10 best three-year periods for stocks. The next three years were never as good as the previous three years. Doesn't mean stocks are, are bad over that period of time. They're just not close to earning that 26%. You can see some of these periods of time here. Uh, a couple of the periods in the 1950s, actually, I think are pretty comparable today because we had a very low interest rate world that we were living in, in, in back in the 1950s. So we'll talk about that in a little bit, but I uh, just thought that was a, a good reminder maybe that we, we need to expect stock returns that are probably going to come down to earth a little bit more than what we've seen over the last three years. So a little bit sobering reality, I think, that we're all faced with here. 
and we are off to a rough start this year, right? We've mentioned it. We've talked about the volatility, uh, but just to put a little bit more historical color on it, uh, through the end of February, it was the fifth worst start ever for stocks. Think about that. Fifth out of what, 90, I guess this goes back to 1926. So that's about 96 years of history. Uh, I was surprised 8% was actually uh, number five worst. Uh, but it was interesting. If you look at the 10 worst starts ever, only two of those periods actually ended up lower at year end. Look at some of the powerful rallies off some of these slow starts historically. Only periods like 2008 and 2000 uh, actually ended up lower the next 10 months. And those two periods were unique because they were featuring a recession, right? 2008 was right in the height of that global financial crisis and the housing bubble bursting. And 2000 rolled, you know, that was the tech bubble bursting, rolling into 9-11 and a recession in 2001. Uh, so clearly, uh, that was one of the unique features of those negative years was that they had a recession. Again, we don't see that as likely playing out, which I think, again, really uh, bodes well for stocks to potentially rally here for the, the last 10 months, uh, especially if we get energy prices, get inflation a little bit under control, right? I think all that starts to become... Uh, a little bit of a, of a tailwind for stocks here in the last 10 months. And one of the big concerns this year, you know, beyond Russia, Ukraine, is how much the Federal Reserve is going to going to hike interest rates. Right. Uh, they're going to hike interest rates uh, uh, next week, uh, most likely uh, by a quarter of percent, a quarter of one percent. And the big question I think the market's struggling with is how much. Are they going to increase interest rates during the course of this year? Are they going to do 1% of moves, which maybe is four different moves, a quarter of 1% each time? Or are they going to do eight, which would be 2% uh, in, in raising short-term interest rates? And uh, you can see here, we looked at the last time the Federal Reserve started raising short-term interest rates. You can see the last four times, uh, stocks were actually higher 12 months later but higher at a much more measured pedestrian pace at 7% per year uh, over the 12 month window. So you can see whenever the Federal Reserve is raising short-term interest rates, it acts as a little bit of a ceiling uh, on the potential stocks can, can return. So I think that's a little bit more of a headwind that we're faced with this year than we faced with in previous years. Right, we just have the reality that uh, the raising short-term interest rates that acts as a break on the economy. Right, tends to slow the economy. Hopefully, slows inflation a little bit, uh, but it should put a little bit of a ceiling on on stock returns. Doesn't mean they'll be negative, uh, but I think uh, it does uh, slow it down a bit. And uh, I think the big question is how much are they going to raise rates? That's really what the market's struggling with, even beyond Russia, Ukraine. That is the main course of concerns because they're worried that if the, the Federal Reserve raises interest rates too much, it could potentially tip the economy into that recession uh, that we touched on earlier. They're more likely to make a mistake the more they raise interest rates. That's certainly what we've seen historically. So I think the market will do better if the Federal Reserve only raises interest rates three or four times this year. And that's really the, the BlackRock scenario, is we see them raising rates three or four four times. There's some in the market that are predicting a lot more. We just don't see that's the case because by the second half of the year, you'll start to see the economy and inflation start to come down. The further that we get away from really the, the depth of the pandemic and some of the economic and inflation havoc that played, I think it'll start to look like what the Fed's doing is actually working, right? That they're raising short-term interest rates is starting to slow the economy gradually, starting to slow inflation, especially core inflation outside of food and energy will look like it's slowing. So it'll look like it's working, which will give them the room to be very patient and deliberate with raising short-term interest rates in 2022 and probably into 2023. And so, the, but the magnitude of rate increases is also important, right? Because if the Fed got spooked thinking, oh my gosh, inflation is starting to run away and they started to make increases like a half a point or three quarters of a point, that would really potentially send shutters through the market. Like, oh my gosh, inflation is a bigger problem. The Fed doesn't have control of it. They're getting behind the curve. 
so isn't that something that uh, Fed watchers and, and market participants are, are interested in trying to figure out? What's their appetite for the magnitude of the increases as well? Yeah, I think uh, you're spot on, Andy. I think that's really what the market was digesting even prior to the Russia-Ukraine situation, right? Stocks were down on the thought that the Fed Reserve was behind the curve on inflation, that they'd have to raise interest rates, right, 2% or more this year, which would be pretty historic, um, and that that would be a big drag and increase the risk to the economy. There's no question. I think that was really the big uh, the big market force that was at play here was the market was really pricing in more Federal Reserve uh, interest rate increases. Because remember, they kept interest rates really low to help the economy get through the pandemic and the shutdowns, right? And then as we tried to restart the economy, inflation took off. Uh, a lot of folks felt that they were a little slow and behind the curve. So uh, as they try to get back and, and try to get inflation under control, the thought was that they, they might act really aggressively. We just don't see that as the scenario. But you're right, right? If we're wrong and they do increase interest rates more, it'll probably be a, a struggle for stocks uh, for the rest of 2022, right? If they, if they end up interest, uh, raising interest rates 2% or more, that'll be a struggle. But one headwind that we've talked a lot about uh, at BlackRock here, and I think we all feel it uh, in a lot of ways throughout the economy, is there's a lot of money on the sidelines, a lot of cash on the sidelines. This is money market assets on the left. You can see historically there's some pretty distinctive peaks when we get cash on the sidelines uh, here. And we're at about $4.4 trillion uh, through the end of January. And you can see historically it always happens around that period of economic uncertainty, right? Folks just build up a lot of cash in the, on the sidelines, right? It happened in January of 2009 during the financial crisis, happened in January of 2003 after stocks lost money three years in a row in the tech bubble of 2000, 2001, 2002. So very, very common pattern, right? A lot of cash on the sidelines. And certainly this time has been a little bit unique because we probably all haven't spent cash like we normally would, right? We haven't gone out or traveled as much as we might normally. Uh, plus all the government stimulus, I think, is in this number. But this generally is a pretty positive uh, indication uh, for riskier assets like stocks in the near term, right? Some of these dollars eventually find their way back into the market, can be very supportive of, of prices in the near term. So I think we'll see this play out this year where you can see what stocks did three years after 2003 in the tech bubble, 2009 in the global financial crisis, stock returns were well above average uh, after all that cash got built up on the sidelines. So it does create a pretty positive backdrop, we think, in the near term. But I think, you know, this is all kind of that, uh, uh, that challenging picture that we face, right? Uh, we've had a great run in stocks. The Federal Reserve's raising short-term interest rates, which tells us, right, that probably puts a little bit of a cap on potential returns for stocks. And, uh, but we've got all this cash on the sidelines, uh, which generally is a positive. Uh, so uh, certainly I think that's the picture. I think that's the tug of war we're gonna see play out through the year, which, which wins, right? Some of the concerns about the near-term uh, economic direction, or does this cash need to get put to work and, uh, uh, especially considering, right, these uh, cash on the sideline accounts are paying little to nothing uh, at today's low interest rates. Do you think that the cash, uh, sorry, uh, do you think the cash on that goes into more like capital expenditures and then businesses trying to grow it and it expand? Or do you think it gets kind of put into stock buybacks or is it just kind of a mix and match of, you know, a little bit of everything? Yeah, it's a great question, Ben. And it's always tough to tell, right, <laughs> right. where it goes. Um, you know, a lot of times when you see it come off the sidelines, it goes everywhere, right? To your mm -hmm. point, and this is why I brought it up with the economy as well, is it, it's not just a market indicator, it tends to be an economic indicator, right? If people have a lot of cash in the sidelines, right, they tend to spend more, not less going forward, right? Especially you think about how the pandemic has receded here, right? The numbers look really good from a pandemic standpoint. We really went really hot for a while with Omicron. And now the numbers have really come down. I feel like we haven't talked about that at all. But think about if we didn't have the Russia-Ukraine situation, we might be more focused on how good the restart potentially could be with a more durable restart across the country, right, post-COVID. So 
I think that's got lost in a little bit in the weeds, but I think you hit the you hit a highlight here, which is true, is that this cash on the sidelines can go everywhere. It's not just the markets. It can go into the economy. It can go into to businesses really taking advantage of that restart. And that's a really powerful factor in the economy, right? We really haven't had that. You know, we've had fits and starts on that restart of the economy post-COVID, right? Some areas better than others, but Imagine if you got something a little bit more durable right across the country. It's a pretty powerful uh, wind at the back of the economy. And I think uh, flowing through to the markets and earnings for stocks. Now, talking about bonds, we haven't, you know, we talked about interest rates, but not bonds. Bonds have lost money uh, last year. Uh, it doesn't happen often that bonds lose money. Here's the top 10 worst years ever for bonds. Believe it or not, last year is number four worst down one and a half percent for the core bond index. Uh, that was the fourth, fourth worst year out of 96 years. Really speaks to why we own bonds in the first place, right? That safety, that stability, that income they provide. The fact that uh, one and a half percent is number four worst uh, really speaks to that reality of why we own bonds and portfolios. Um, we are negative though to start the year for bonds. Interest rates have trended higher here to start the year. So, if the year ended today, we'd actually have back-to-back -back years in which bonds have lost money, which is rare, but it has happened historically. You can see twice in the mid fifties, it happened. Uh, and the losses were pretty light there. You can see there were three of the four were less than 1%. Uh, so pre pretty negligible for the most part, uh, but it can happen. And certainly something we'll keep an eye on. Again, it, we mentioned the 1950s, very comparable today because it was a very low interest rate world back in the 1950s. When we were coming out of the World War II era, the Great Depression era, we had to pay for the war. So they kept interest rates low for a very extended period of time. Uh, sounds kind of similar, right, to what we've lived here in the last handful of years. But it is just the result of a low interest rate world that we're living in, is that we'll probably see more calendar years where bonds lose money. Hopefully, though, it'll follow the trend where those losses are extremely light and not super impactful to the overall outcome of, of folks' investments. And here's probably a better way to look at it, actually. Uh, always one of my favorite charts, and you can see I have a lot of favorites here. Uh, but you can see this is interest rates on the red line going back to the 1920s, and then the yellow bar is bond returns by decade. And you can see the, the low interest rate, low bond returns back in the 1940s and 1950s. That's why I keep on bringing up the 1950s as a comparable period, because we're really in a very similar point from an interest rate standpoint. You can see at year end interest rates are were one and a half percent on a US 10 year, 10 year treasury bond. Uh, we're at about 1.8% today. So we've come up a little bit off one and a half percent, but very reminiscent to where we were in the 1940s, 1950s. What this relationship shows, you can see the, 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 the red line tends to lead the yellow bar, right? Is wherever ever interest rates start, that's generally where bond returns finish, right? You can see it through the 80s, 90s, into the 2000s. Wherever that red line started the decade, that's where bond returns finish. Of course, the challenge for us is that 10 years from now, we're going to look back and bond returns are going to look like the 1940s and 1950s, right? Somewhere between one and a half and two percent the lowest returns we've seen for bonds in 70 years and i think this is one of the biggest challenges we talk about in portfolios certainly i know andy and ben are doing some things with portfolios uh, that are a little bit different than you had to do in the 1980s 1990s when bonds were returning 12 percent or 7.7 percent right uh, just a a different environment and probably one of the biggest challenges Right. You need to find a little bit more income, a little bit more return, but balance the risk uh, uh, with the overall portfolio. All right. Back in those days, you could buy long duration bonds. And as long as the credit quality was good, you clipped a good coupon and investing in bonds was easy. Now we're looking at it saying, well, what blend of tips, what blend of convertibles, what blend of floating rate bank notes, what blend of uh, foreign bonds, it's that mixture of things that uh, can try to earn some yield and hedge the risk of rising interest rates. So it, it's it's certainly not, not easy. There are no easy answers in front of us. Yeah, no silver bullet. And I, you know, Andy, I always say it's the ultimate financial irony, right? Frustrating as heck. 
that we've got all these baby boomers looking for for safety, looking for stability, looking for income. And look at the picture we're faced with today, right? It's just the ultimate right. irony and That's frustrating exactly. irony that uh, it's not as easy, right? Think about, you know, like you said, getting 12% in, in bonds with no risk back in the 80s, right? It's just the opposite end of that spectrum is what we're dealing with today. You're right. And then, you know, you know, some people are you know, trying to, well, how can I juice returns and I want higher returns? And, and that's all great, except that leads us to a portfolio that's, you know, invested more heavily in stock, uh, which historically, you know, as we're seeing, these returns look great. But I always point out to investors that, um, you know, while the probability is low uh, from 1929, stocks declined 89.3%. Uh, bottomed in 1937 and took until 1954 to come back to even. So if you were 20 years old over that 25 year period and you could invest money, that was a wonderful time to invest. Uh, but if you're in, you know, your mid fifties uh, or older, uh, do you have 25 years to wait for the portfolio to come back? So should you allocate all of your money to stocks? And that that's the, the real tricky point, I, I think, here for many investors. They don't realize how much more risk they have to take to try to earn those higher returns and now may not be the best time to be chasing returns. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, just finishing up with, with the last couple of things here, the other aspect that just amplifies the challenge even more is how inflation's come up, right? It, uh, the highest inflation we've had in 40 years, the number is actually seven and a half percent inflation over the last year, end of January. Uh, we're actually going to get the inflation number tomorrow. Our folks think it's going to be 8%, uh, right, which is a really, really high number. And I think one of the things that gets missed in the headlines, it's not just higher inflation, it's those lower interest rates we just talked about. Look at the gap between inflation and interest rates on the chart on the right. This is the biggest gap we've seen between inflation and interest rates since that 1950s period again, right? Again, the 50s keep on coming up. Um, but this is a challenge, right? There is nothing else you can do to fight this inflation challenge than to have a good, well-diversified portfolio, right? There's no other answer. And it might sound self-fulfilling, right, for, for us to talk about that, but it is the fundamental reality. Think about all the cash we talked about on the sidelines. Those dollars are losing out to inflation like they haven't lost in 70 plus years since that 1950s period. I just think we need to ring the bell on this more. I think a lot of folks don't realize uh, t the degree of this challenge, right? Everybody talks about higher inflation, but the fact that inflation and interest rates look like this, the widest gap in 70 years, is really the investing challenge. And, and that's one of the tricky things about inflation, right? You, you feel it at the gas pump, you feel it at the grocery store, but you never get a statement showing how much your purchasing power is eroded, right? The government doesn't send out that statement showing how much purchasing power you've lost to inflation, right? You get a bill on taxes, you can see what your returns are for your portfolio, but it's really hard to see the impact to inflation on your savings and your purchasing power. So I think that always makes inflation a little bit of this phantom menace, if you will, uh, within our, it's such a different thing than, than we're used to dealing with. And right, if, focused, if, if folks aren't focused on it, uh, it's very easy to lose sight and to realize how much some of those dollars are losing out to inflation, right? When you haven't lost out to it, like in 70 years, I think that puts a little bit more context and color around it. And I won't spend too much time here. I just wanted to highlight some items that are going up in price. I, I call this my circus tent of inflation chart uh, that looks at some of the categories of inflation and where we're seeing prices, right? Meat, fish, poultry, and eggs up big. Uh, you're seeing some of these items that'll be a little bit more temporary, like lodging away from home on the bottom left is uh, hotel rooms. Um, some other things, uh, car rent, car and truck rental in the middle bottom uh, is pretty high, but you're seeing a pretty broad base of price pressure here. Uh, housing, for example, housing is one of the biggest part, is the biggest part of this index. 41% of inflation is housing prices, uh, but they don't actually use housing prices, believe it or not. They actually use rents. So they don't, there's not one housing price in the inflation index. So we've seen housing prices go up 20%, but it's not flowing through the inflation calculation because rents are kind of a different an animal than housing prices. They tend to lag housing prices. So we're starting to see a lot of price uh, pressure in rents across the country. It's the biggest component of this.
it's inflation index. It's going to be a, a, something that's going to see continued pressure here in 2022. I don't know if we have any landlords on the call, but uh, I think you all know that when you see housing prices go up uh, so much for so long, it gives landlords a lot more leverage and ability to raise rents in the near term. And we're really starting to see that play out here in 2022. So that's one item within inflation that's not going to be uh, as temporary as some of these others that uh, that uh, got moved around with the pandemic. And let me finish up with that diversified portfolio, not to, uh, to beat this drum or ring this bell too much, but it is really the, the most important period of our lifetimes. Just have a well thought out diversified financial plan. I know most of you on the call probably uh, already have that uh, with Andy and Ben, but just want to give you an example uh, of the last 20 years uh, of this diversified portfolio because there's an emotional dynamic to it that I don't think a lot of folks appreciate that you still lose money in a diversified portfolio when the market goes down, like we've seen year to date or 2008 was probably the best example. Uh, this is a 60, 40 diversified stock and bond portfolio. So 60% stock, 40% bond. I know everybody has something a little different based on your risk tolerance and where you're at in the investment life cycle. Uh, but you can see that uh, that doesn't feel good, right? With my fancy emojis down 26%. Uh, then on the flip side, when, when stock prices go up, right? And the bull market returns, you don't make as much. And probably no better example than 2009 to 2019. It was actually the longest US economic expansion ever. It wasn't the best or the fastest economic growth, but it was the longest from a time period standpoint. The only decade in history that we actually haven't had a recession. Uh, was the decade of the 2010s. And you can see how much the diversified portfolio trailed, right? That doesn't feel so good either. And then we had the same dynamic happen, <coughs> excuse me, in a condensed time, time period uh, the last two years, right? Where the first quarter of 2020, a very quick but painful bear market with the pandemic and the shutdowns, diversified portfolio lost 23%. But then as the market rallied the last year and three quarters, right? Stocks were up big and the diversified portfolio trailed again. So you go through this, these time periods where you lose money, you trail, you lose money, you trail. It's really hard to see the diversified portfolio, why it makes sense, right? We always joke with folks that, you know, you have a well-diversified portfolio. If it never feels good or rarely <laughs> feels good, it's probably the best way to say it. And that's what we see so often. But if we actually add up this entire, and this is a little bit more than 20 years, Believe it or not, the diversified portfolio ends up ahead over this stretch, even though it didn't feel like it for most of the journey, right? You actually ended up ahead and did so with a heck of a lot less risk, right? And think about this 20 years. I think Andy hit it up front. Think about what we've lived with this 20 years, right? Tech bubble, 9-11, global financial crisis, housing bust, longest U.S. economic expansion in there. And then you have, right, the global pandemic uh, as the cherry on top, along with Russia invading Ukraine. So uh, truly historic period. And the diversified portfolio held up as well as it did. This is what we call BlackRock winning more by losing less. Right? Mark, winning that, more by losing less. You know what? That just really hits home. You know, raising uh, teenage boys, having the discussion, you know, oh, I had a B in the class, so I didn't turn in my homework, so I thought I was okay. Well, guess what? You got a zero on that homework assignment. Let me show you how zeros have an uncanny ability to absolutely destroy other numbers. And only when you do the math, do you kind of realize, oh yeah, I guess I should have turned in my homework. So what you're saying is the diversified portfolio is turning in your homework every single time because that helps keep you afloat. <laughs> Uh, with, when the bad, you know, grades inevitably come in, come in around that. And, and so, but on a more serious note, really trying to eliminate the big downswings, because that means you don't have as much ground to recover from, even if you don't feel like I'm hitting a home run and, you know, whether the S&P is up more or whether commodities are up more or whether pork belly futures or Bitcoin are up more, you're still saying, wait a minute, I'm spreading the risk out over all these things. So at least I have a chance to come back if there's a really bad, uh, a bad number that comes in there. Yeah, exactly right. Right. You think about what we're trying to do with the diversified portfolio. Just get a chunk of the upside of the bull market, right? You don't need all of it. Look at some of these periods where you didn't get anywhere close to all of the upside uh, of what stocks and the stock market did. But more importantly, you limited losses in those downturns, right? That's the combination that works. It's just tough to see it. 
right? Play yeah. out, tough to connect the dots, right? Emotionally uh, with that portfolio. And it's really, you know, we're kind of guilty of this as an industry. We need to look at the market more like this, right? Where you look at the good and the bad together, right? We too often, and I was guilty of it earlier in the presentation where we look at calendar years or we look at three, five, 10 year periods of time on statements. We need to look at the good and the bad. It really hi highlights why we build portfolios the way we do, why we asset allocate and diversify, and why we spread inve investors' uh, eggs across a variety of investment baskets, right? It's, it's to, to limit that downside, which can really impair portfolios, right, if those losses get too deep. Right. You know, and it just goes back to most families, you know, say, um, you know, yeah, I'd love to have more upside, but if that means I might have to start over when I'm 50, uh, that doesn't feel so good either because I remember what it was like to have nothing when I was 25. And so I don't want to go back to, you know, ketchup soup and ramen noodles for dinner every night. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think I'm out of charts, believe it or not here, Andy, but hopefully that was helpful. Um, you know, think about where we started, the amazing resilience of the markets through some of these geopolitical concerns, lots of concerns, the big one, the Fed raising interest rates, uh, short-term interest rates this year acts as a little bit of a ceiling on stocks, but a lot of cash in the sidelines. Uh, we think that might be a positive uh, a tailwind for the, the, the rest of the calendar year here at some point. Uh, bonds are the bigger challenge, right? Those low interest rates mean low bond returns, especially when inflation's elevated, that gap between inflation and interest rates, creating the, the biggest challenge we've seen in 70 years from an investing standpoint. Don't underestimate that, right? Uh, certainly if you have cash on the sidelines or no folks with cash on the sidelines, make sure uh, they're working with Ben and Andy because uh, I don't think they realize the, the hole they're digging. It can be pretty quick uh, in this type of inflation and low rate world. Uh, and of course, that diversified portfolio is the answer, right? There's nothing else you can find, unfortunately, in today's world that solves for that gap. Uh, so uh, I'll stop there, see if there's any other thoughts or questions or comments on there. I'd love to hear what's on everybody's mind. Yeah, Mark, uh, thanks for, for all that. And I think, you know, that really hits home. You know, like you mentioned, you brought up all those issues that are going on. So where do we do? What do we turn to? It's kind of sticking to the diversified portfolio, sticking to the financial plan, letting that be what ultimately dictates um, kind of your investment strategy. Um, one of the questions I had is uh, I was actually starting to see uh, articles already coming out about stagflation. Are you seeing or hearing anything about stagflation and what, you know, is there is that a what kind of probability is it that we could even get to that or do you think the fed will be able to navigate that and, and kind of keep us from from ultimately hitting uh that yeah that one has come up quite a bit uh, here lately and stagflation for folks who don't uh, know stagflation that's the combination of high inflation and a bad economy by right? a recessionary economy so uh, normally, those two wouldn't you wouldn't think normally exist because normally you have to have a good economy to have higher inflation, right? Where people have money to pay more for goods at higher prices, right? But you do have these periods of time, like in the '70s and '80s, where you had high inflation, and that high inflation was a drag on the economy, right? Uh, where folks were spending more on energy. So certainly that's what's popped up, especially with the energy prices going up, right? That we're going to spend a lot more on energy than we have recent in recent years. And that would uh, eat into our budgets, eat into our spending here in the near term and really slow the economy. Uh, again, I think it's such a unique period that we're going, you know, just with the pandemic and the shutdown and now the restart, that there's so much more fundamentally strong footing for the economy. Doesn't mean it's not possible that the stagflation is not off the table, right? Especially if the Fed moves too far too fast. And I think that's what the market was worried about, uh, especially prior to the Russia uh, invasion of Ukraine. But we do think it's probably the, the very lightest scenario at this point in time, right? I think you'd really have to look in down to 2023 before you start to really get concerns about that, um, where, you know, the economy might start to slow, the Fed's put in some higher interest rates. Uh, I really don't see it in 2022. And, and again, I think that that'll be a positive uh, as we go march through 2022, as that becomes more clear. Uh, but I don't think you can take it off the table uh, for, for 2023 or 2024. I think the hope then, though, is that inflation comes back down, right, as we further we get back from the pandemic. So we see it as a very, very unlikely scenario, but not completely off the table. 
because again, we've seen energy prices uh, shoot up more than what we'd expect. Uh, certainly that'll drag a little bit on the economy. But again, don't underestimate that fundamental restart, right? Uh, and just the good COVID news that nobody seems to want to, to talk about anymore right now. Yeah, awesome. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so, you know, right now between, you know, you got the, the Fed raising interest rates and, you know, those discussions, as well as obviously the, the conflict in, in Ukraine, um, would you be able to put a, a priority on which one you think has a, a larger impact on the U.S. economy uh, between those two um, uh, events? Yeah, they're, they're, I would say they're both intertwined a little bit because uh, the thought was when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, and you have energy prices go up. That limits the amount the Fed is probably going to be able to raise interest rates, right? Because they don't want to create an additional drag on the economy. Uh, I think the Fed is probably still more directly impacting our market and our economy more, right? Uh, I think certainly the, the Ukraine-Russia situation, if it continues to, to linger and get any worse, it, you know, that, that order of priority might change a little bit. But I think uh, given where we're headed right now, it seems to be still the Federal Reserve raising short-term interest rates, having a bigger, longer-term lasting impact on our economy in 2022. Right. Doesn't mean, again, I think the fundamental shift of Russia invading Ukraine is a is a game changer from a geopolitical outlook standpoint. Right. I think it changes the way we all look at the world. But that's probably, again, longer term. Right. I, I think it's even too early to digest that even in the last week and a half. Right. That we've dealt with it. I think we're going to have to really get some more time there to really understand what that means longer term. But I think, in the you know, for the markets, and the economy, Federal Reserve. Right. If we knew exactly, you know, I think if, if you told the market they're only going to raise rates three or four times this year, I think the market would be up 10 percent tomorrow. And that's the crystal ball that I don't own, by the way. <laughs> uh, I hate to make right. crystal ball predictions, but I think just trying to highlight, uh, you know, just uh, the importance of, of that reality in, in our economy, in our markets today. Interesting. So Mark, we have a question coming here. I think I can kind of paraphrase it a little bit. Um, I think they're asking uh, with higher um, energy prices, I think what they're getting at is, will this help accelerate the move towards greener energy and maybe help the administration with its climate change uh, kind of initiatives? And I know BlackRock, uh, you know, sort of looks at this too, just from purely not a political standpoint, but an investment standpoint, an investment thesis that, um, uh, that uh, alternative energy and sort of decarbonizing some of the stuff that, that's out there, um, you know, that, that there are economic reasons to do it, um, uh, you know, going forward too. What, what's your kind of thought about, does this accelerate, higher energy prices accelerate that movement? Yeah, probably at the margin, no question, right? You probably get folks a little bit more focused, uh, right, on the the benefit of going to electric cars, for example, and not paying those higher gas prices. Certainly that could pull forward some of that demand, no question. But you also have the other end of the spectrum where higher traditional energy source prices creates the really the, the demand for folks to try to pull it out of the ground at higher prices, right? It's, it's one of those things where eventually the supply needs to equal the demand to get those prices down a little bit lower, right? We've got to meet supply. So I think you'll see a little bit of that balancing act. And I think when you hear, hear our folks talk about it is you do need a, a transition, right? To cleaner energy at some point, you can't do it abruptly. Otherwise you see really high traditional energy prices, which aren't good for the economy, right? Uh, across, uh, especially when you start thinking about folks that, uh, uh, maybe aren't able to to automatically you know transition to an electric vehicle. Well, and it's it to me it's it's even more uh, fundamental. You know, I think about like the natural gas pipe that comes into my house. What's the solution in the very near term to that? I, I don't see how there is one because you can't just uproot that infrastructure and change it to something else overnight. Um, and you know, you could put solar panels on every house, but that doesn't. That doesn't solve for the need to burn gas when it gets really cold and it's overcast. So I, I, I don't know that, that the you know, transition can be a total overnight anyway. Yeah, and I think you've seen it in Europe, right, where they've tried to, to, to more hard transition to, to renewable energy sources. And it's, it's created a challenge in their economy where they're relying too much on Russia, right, that they're relying too much on some of these, these cleaner sources. And they're not quite there yet, right, where it does, it's going to take 
multiple years to get there, right? I think that's a little bit of frustration for some folks, but I think that the, we're seeing the economic realities of that and even the geo, geopolitical realities of that, right? That it's going to be a transition. I think if you hear our folks, right, they understand that, you know, when we talk about it. Um, but we all know, right, uh, as we get there, uh, you know, that it'll be a better, better reality, better place to be because we won't be as reliant, right? And and you think about the economy, right? If we weren't worried as much about $120 oil, right, uh, probably creates a more stable economy and market uh, when you can take some of those things off the table. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the way I look. It's kind of a slow plotting. I thought about this last night. I was I looked up and uh, we replaced most of our bulbs as they burned out with LEDs, but I looked up and there was an incandescent bulb in the ceiling that had burned out. And I looked up and thought, huh, that's one of the last ones that's not LED. So you think about when we bought our house 10 years ago, they were all incandescent. Now they're almost all LED. I'd love to know the, the energy impact uh, on, uh, on that. It, it's got to be, you know, if it uses 10% of the electricity, that has to be you know, pretty profound if every household is kind of going through that transition. So yeah, one, and you think, one bite at a time. Yeah, exactly. You think about the transition and do, do it right. We probably have to push the envelope a little bit and take step backs, right? I think that's a little bit what we're feeling now, right? Where you push the envelope and you try to push it a little bit, but then you got to take a step back and realize, right, you don't want to do damage, especially the folks that are most vulnerable. So, right, that doesn't feel right. You know, maybe it's swung a little bit too far with energy prices going a little bit too far, but again, it doesn't feel right that it's a, a negative overall, right, longer term for the economy and where we're headed. Yeah. All right. Well, that looks like uh, it for the questions coming in here today. Um, anything else, Ben, on your on your side? No, I just want to say you know, thank you, Mark, so much for, for taking the time and, and joining us and, and sharing all of your insights, uh, your student of the markets. I believe you, is it, it's available every month um, on BlackRock. And That's uh, right. yeah, so I just want to say thanks for, for stopping by and uh, sharing that with us. So viewers can go to blackrock.com and just search for student of the market and uh, yeah. be able to find the slides. Exactly. Yeah. Google BlackRock student of the markets. It's the first thing that pops up. It is client approved. So okay. folks can take a look uh, at what we have uh, every month, hopefully uh, fairly understandable and relevant and timely with what's going on. No, I think it's great. I think you've laid it out in a, in a wonderful format. We try to do a lot of that here too. And so you know, we, we appreciate you putting that together uh, for us and uh, our families. And uh, we certainly appreciate you coming on today and spending your time sharing your opinion. We look forward to connecting with you again soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thanks. Right. Bye. Thank Bye.